mystery, mystery. Life is a riddle and a mystery. Where do we come from? Where are we going? Good morning. Welcome to our time of celebration, reflection and community. I'm Leslie Hartley, a member at St Mark's Edinburgh and previously at King Edward Street Chapel in Macclesfield, Cheshire. And I bring you greetings from the Edinburgh congregation because they all wanted to know why I wasn't going to be there today. And they're presently enjoying what feels like a period of great calm after a very busy and hectic Edinburgh Festival of Fringe. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? In today's service, we'll look at the origins of Unitarianism and how we think we see Unitarianism today, hopefully raising questions about where Unitarian is in going from here. We have a new Chief Officer, and we've met her, haven't we? That's at the meeting, Liz Slade. And if you get the opportunity to look at her blog on the GA News, then you'll see she's written several articles her latest article reflects the beginnings of Unitarianism, but also questions how Unitarianism could grow in these times when congregations seem to be shrinking in number. She writes, Most people are unlikely to want to talk about the nature of God on a first date, but many people are hungry for spaces where they can explore nuanced shades of grey that our culture often doesn't make space for. And perhaps, this is the first invitation Unitarians can offer, the opportunity to explore. Let us take a few moments to invite the spirit of life and of love to be present among us, to awaken within us. And now I'll write the chalice with words from Richard Gilbert. We bid you welcome with, who come with weak, weary spirit seeking rest, who come with troubles that are too much with you, who come hurt and afraid. We bid you welcome who come with hope in your heart, who come with anticipation in your step, who come proud and joyous. We bid you welcome who are seekers of a new faith, who come to probe and explore, who come to learn. We bid you welcome who enter this hall as a homecoming, who have found room here for your spirit, who find in this people a family. Whoever you are, whatever you are, wherever you are on your journey, we bid you welcome. Our hymns today are all in the Purple Book and our opening hymn is number 42. And I've been told that you do know this one, so I shall play the more advanced accompaniment for this one because David Dawson's accompaniment in the Purple Book is lovely but it's not the original one. There's a lovely little book called Singing Your Journey, a little blue book which is often used by choirs and smaller groups at church and they've got the original version of, the, of this one in there. So number 42 from the light of days remembered. Well, son, we have a story for all ages, and we are all ages, except we haven't got the very youngest of us. So just to have a little think about, well, this, this happened to us during the festival quite a lot. So it's something to share with you that's actually happened many times, but happens even more during the festival. Sometimes my husband and I do what we call front of house. When there's a special event going on in church, especially during the festival, where we're also known as Venue 125. The Edinburgh Festival finished last Sunday and it's been full on. The front of house is where we need somebody from the church usually to say hello as people come in and say toilets are here and here and to make sure everything goes smoothly and to show people how our taps work because people have a lot of problem with our taps, where the light switches are, you know the sort of things. And sometimes people who are visiting, in fact, very often when people are visiting, stop and say to us, this is the first time I've been to a Unitarian church, so what's a Unitarian? And you think, now, do you want the short answer or the long answer? And we try to explain as clearly as we can. 
But you know, it's quite easy for children because we did have a little one who was about eight to say, what's a Unitarian? So sometimes if children at school, someone might say to them, do you go to a church or anything? And if you'd say, yes, I go to Church of the Divine Unity, it's a Unitarian church, they might say, well, what's a Unitarian? Very valid question. What do you believe? So what do you say? Adults sometimes only want a very short answer. They really don't want you to go through the book. But for children, actually, it's very easy. So the previous Sunday, I've been working with our children's group, and we open with a, a little saying at the beginning. So we say, I'm a Unitarian. I go to a church where people have open minds, loving hearts, and hands that are ready to help. And in fact, lots of children's group use these at the beginning of their activities each week. If you're a bit older, perhaps a teenager, looking very stroppy, you could do something very different. If someone asks you, what do Unitarians believe anyway? You could, in true teenage fashion, turn the tables and answer with, we believe in asking good questions. And what do you believe? Be warned though, asking a lot of questions can be extremely annoying. So I'm a Unitarian. I go to a church where people have open minds, loving hearts and hands that are ready to help. And now we come to our reading, which is called A History of Church, Including Yours. There are nine little parts to this, and I will read the odd-numbered ones, and I have kind volunteers who will read the even-numbered ones. A History of Church, Including Yours. One day your church was born. Maybe it was a gathering of saints called together for the common worship of a wrathful God. Or maybe a few brave souls answered a notice in the newspaper, curiosity piqued by the announcement of a religion where free thinking and tolerance were foundation stones. No matter how it happened, your church was born. A gathering of people, humble, caring, anxious and quirky, all at the same time, who covenanted to be with one another on the journey of life, death and everything in between. And so it began, a faithful few, beautifully imperfect, called to that settled task, that human task of connecting, loving and serving. It was just a baby and yet it was thrust deep into the human condition, tasked to hold minds and souls, bodies and hearts along the roller coaster of disease and birth, infighting and joy, and Christmas celebrations, sometimes all of those at the same time. They gathered to hear the world broken open for insightful sermons, rejuvenating music, and a community whose fierce devotion to each other's well-being rival the mother bears for her cubs. But it wasn't always like that, of course. There were the trying times, and I don't just mean the netherworld of committee meetings. No, I mean the trying times when the church almost split in half over the war of integration, or when the mill left the town vacant, or when the minister crossed that line and the people couldn't speak about it for decades. But somehow you were still here still the church that everyone recognises, still the one that shows up every time you were called on. New people came and they changed things, small things, big things, things that nobody noticed as it happened, until suddenly it was hard to even recognise anything anymore. That was a hard moment, a tearful moment. And other things changed too. The proclamations about God once heard loud from the pulpit softened. Wrathful became loving. Distant became intimate. Mandatory became optional. After the war, the Sunday school rooms were overflowing. Each baby dedicated reminded the church of the incredible beauty of life and the gift this community all huddled around the baby would bestow upon this child. The history of your church is more a story of the determination of love to break forth than it is about coffee mornings or chalices, sermon discussions 
or social justice committee meetings. The history of the church is the history of human enterprise, evolving in its sights and sounds, yet revolving always around its core. The history of your church is the gift of potential and momentum, of baggage and personality. The history of your church is the launch pad from which you spring into action or disarray. And together, each, each day, day your, your church, church is born. Thank you, the readers. I was at Glasgow the other week and said that um, playing for the hymns and doing the service is a bit like doing a one-woman show in the middle of the festival. Except their piano is a lot nearer. <laughs> Apologies for the walking up and down. Oh, I know, I know what I've got. There's something in my bag. I must get out because it's my most important thing to show you today. on it, it has been washed and ironed and carefully folded to bring you today. I don't know if you've got any of these in your kitchen. No, no they, they were on, they've been on sale at various GAs, I'll just leave it there. And people always look at them and say, my church isn't on there. Well, neither of my churches are on there. I'll just <laughs> leave that there for you. Our Unitarian tea towel. I've seen similar ones in many Unitarian kitchens, so you have to be careful not to pick someone else's up if you've taken yours along to help with the teas. All the church buildings on the tea towel all look so very different and all have congregations that are very diverse, yet they share a common approach in their faith. Nearly all Unitarian churches in the UK have their own websites where they state their beliefs and way of worship. And these statements are examples of answer to the line, what are we, from our opening song. And for instance, on your website, you have a bold opening statement. The Newcastle Unitarian Church welcomes those of all faiths and those of no faith. On St Mark's website, we have something very similar. We support the pursuit of individual spirituality within a community of diverse beliefs. And gathering statements from other churches, in fact, 170 of them, we can construct, you should might have one of these that you can see, a word cloud. And the word cloud shows the most frequently used words, filtering out, filtering out words such as in, on, an, and the, etc., and gives the most frequently used words showing greater prominence. And this word cloud shows the 50 most frequently used words from approximately 170 website statements, which was about three and a half thousand words. It was a bit of a labour of love to do it, but there we are. But look at the bold words. Community, huge, free, liberal, open, everyone, meaning, questioning. Are these words that you would expect to see representing the UK Unitarians? Here are some of the fuller statements which caught my eye, but don't worry, I'm not going to read 170 of them. On the Unitarian Organisation website, this is the opening statement on the home page, an inclusive approach to a shared spiritual journey. Unitarians emphasise freedom of conscience and affirm the validity of many religious traditions, as well as science and secular culture. And that was written by the Reverend Joe James. In Derby Unity, they've said, we believe that in the light of new understanding and insights, our beliefs might change. We believe that when we know better, we should do better. From Bank Street, Bolton, our purpose is to inspire spiritual journeys engaging with the world with open hearts and open minds. And from Chester, a spiritual community who encourage you to think for yourself, a faith worth thinking about. 
And my particular favourite is this very visual statement from the old dissenting meeting house in Sidworth. A nun, a rabbi and an atheist walk into a church. We welcome tourists, seekers, doubters, pilgrims and you. We offer a special welcome to those who are single, widowed, divorced, married, cohabiting in a civil partnership or a complicated relationship. If you are rich, poor, noisy or shy, you are particularly welcome. Especially welcome are toddlers, babies, dogs on strings, teenagers, the elderly, the old, the very old, the very, very old, and the middle-aged and the young, the childless parents, grandparents and great-grandparents, the overworked, the unemployed or the lazy. You will feel at home here if you are in recovery, addicted or trying to give up, angry, disaffected or apathetic. We offer a special welcome to the homeless, refugees, immigrants, second homeowners, precariously housed or in a gated community. If your religious beliefs are Hindu, Sunni, Shia or Ahmadiyya Muslim, Protestant, Catholic, Jain, Drew, Druid, Wiccan, not sure, don't care or born again, you are accepted. Atheists and agnostics are specially welcome. Here you will find fellow travellers looking for spiritual, artistic and intellectual growth, opportunities to explore and learn and a rich heritage of over three centuries of dissent and democracy. I'd love to see their congregation. Mm -hmm. These web extractions are congregation's personal responses to what are we? The present, the now of Unitarianism. So where have we come from? The beginnings of Unitarianism, when our church movement was born, marked a key change in the way that people wanted to worship. On holiday in Prague last year, I was aware how close we were to the very first organised Unitarian church in the 16th century in Transylvania. At this time, Reformation throughout Europe gave rise to Protestant Christians who rejected the papal authority, saw no basis for creeds in the scriptures and conceived of God as a unity rather than a trinity. If God was one, then it followed that Jesus was not God. Although Unitarianism began with the Reformation, it was a long while before Unitarian was actually used in the name of a church. In 1566, David Ferenc, an early precursor of Unitarianism, regularly preached in the great church of Koloshvar, a church that still stands today. Michael Servetus, his contemporary in France, wrote two important treaties, Errors of the, of the Trinity and Dialogues on the Trinity, and his writings and beliefs led him to be searched for by the Spanish Inquisition. Michael had to change his name and profession in order to remain unnoticed, but was eventually arrested and burned at the stake in 1533. Back to just a few years ago, the Reverend Roger Fritz from the States, who visited Edinburgh services during August, was very keen to tell me that a copy of one of Servetus's books is actually in the Edinburgh University Library. A third precursor was Faustus Sosinus, an Italian who moved to Poland. His teaching caused an uproar, and in 1598 he was forced to flee the country after university students attempted to kill him. And so to the 17th century, where John Biddle was imprisoned for much of his life because of his writings. In his 12 questions or arguments drawn out of scripture, he used his knowledge of scripture to demonstrate that the Holy Spirit did not exist. In Edinburgh, the ill-fated student Thomas Aikenhead was arrested, tried, found guilty and put to death for his beliefs. He was the last one to do so. He asked too many questions about seeking the truth of religion. The Act of Toleration passed in England in 1689 exempted dissenters from attending services at Anglican churches and allowed them to build their own chapels. 
and my last chapel in Macclesfield was one of those built in the 17th century. It had stairs outside and it resembled a barn so that if anything happened it could revert to being a barn. Many chapels had the word Presbyterian in their titles, but it took until the 18th century, 1774, before a chapel was called Unitarian. And this was Essex Street Chapel in London. My last church was built in 1690, but it remained an independent chapel in the Trinitarian tradition until 1764, when the Reverend John Palmer began his ministry there. From the 15th to the 18th centuries, ministers who were reformist, Presbyterian, Unitarian, nonconformist, whatever you choose to call them, were viewed with suspicion, with governments becoming increasingly alarmed at a rise of politi political agitation during times such as the French, Re French Revolution. Unitarian ministers were often subject to unwarranted attack by anti-dissenting groups. In fact, Joseph Priestley's home in Birmingham was burned to the ground. And in Dundee, Thomas Fish Palmer, who just happened to edit some dissenting words, was arrested on grounds of sedition and transported to Botany Bay. He survived his time in Australia, but caught a disease on the way back and died on the ship. A new religious society was formed in Edinburgh in 1776, which is the oldest, longest-lived Unitarian congregation in Scotland. It was originally known as, wait for this snappy title, Successors of the Remnant, who testified against the corruption of the Revolution Constitution of the Church of Scotland. Why have one word when you can use 20? In 1792, they changed that name to the Universal Dissenters, However, the first Scottish congregation to bear the name of Unitarian was the Montrose Congregation, led by William Christie in 1781. St Mark's current building was opened in 1835, and it was only one of two Unitarian churches in the UK to be identified with a saint's name, and no one knows why. And in that year, every member of the congregation was required to give formal assent to this contentious declaration of principles. Being desirous of admission to the privileges of a member of the Edinburgh Unitarian Society, I solemnly declare that it is my intention to associate with them for the worship of the one God, the Father, to the exclusion of all other persons, beings or subsistences, in obedience to the instructions of our blessed Saviour whose divine mission I fully recognise evidenced by his life, death, resurrection, recorded in the New Testament, and whom I regard not as a supreme God, but as the one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And that last sentence is very close in text to the one that you can see high up, if you look very high up, on the front elevation of St Mark's. <coughs> one God, one mediator between God and the men, the man, Jesus Christ. Following this, a large number of members left the church, surprise, surprise, <laughs> rather than conform to that affirmation. And it wasn't until 1854 that the constitution was changed to concede to each other entire freedom in the interpretation of the records of the Christian faith. 19th century James Martineau, the influential Unitarian scholar, tackled the problem of possible conflicts between reason and scripture, helping to crystallise the distinctive philosophy of Unitarianism. His conclusion was that the only true sources of authority were reason and conscience, and where there was conflict between scripture and reason, reason should prevail. And simply put, a demand for the freedom to think, question, to entertain and to explore reservations, to beg to differ. When I first visited here, the Church of the Divine Unity, I was given a copy of the sermon from the opening <coughs> service, which took place 
on January the 21st, 1940. I believe there probably is a large, still a large box of these in the vestry somewhere. The, Robert, the Reverend Herbert Barnes proposed in approximately four and a half thousand words in his sermon that religion had three fundamental things to offer in these troublous times. Of course, it was the start of World War II. That religion offers an ideal for the individual. Religion offers a vision for society. Religion offers avenues of approach to divine reality, faith in God and in the human spirit. He wrote, to preach this God to this day and generation will be the task of this church, the church's greatest contribution to the present day world is to awaken in men and women a keen sense of the reality of the presence of God. So what would our Unitarian forebears say to these lines and then those I read earlier from websites? What would they say to this comment from someone I met in a congregation in Prague? Oh, this isn't a church. It's a congregation of people who share similar ideas. Or this handout from Macclesfield Unitarians. This place is not about religion, it's about life. Here we each take the freedom to do our own thinking and wondering, and we all give one another respect, understanding and encouragement. You're on your own journey, but you're not on your own. Perhaps then, that's the answer to the third question in the song. Where are we going? Well, we're not always quite sure, but we know there are others of a like mind to accompany us on the journey. I found Unitarianism 23 and a bit years ago. I went along to our local uh, Unitarian chapel when I was on maternity leave because it was the nearest church and I was missing doing Christmas music with the children at school. I'm still trying to work out what Unitarianism means to me. I know it supports my spiritual journey. It provides substance for my views about social justice and it offers opportunities to discuss, debate, and to change my mind if I want to. I'm part of a group currently working on defining our vision, which we see as being linked to our values of being kind to ourselves, of being kind to each other and to the earth, to live peacefully, joyfully, and in integrity, and to keep learning, loving, and growing. And may all our Unitarian spiritual journeys be filled with these human values. Waiaya. And it sounds like it should come from Newcastle. It actually comes from South Africa. And the words of it are in this little book here. And I'll find it in here. We have a little group of singers in St Mark's called the Chalice Singers and uh, we sang this once. Where do we come from? And then we found out that the words were actually no, I don't have to why are our words? The words are actually on a famous painting, and I, I bet some of you have seen this painting but didn't notice the words. This church is a body. May this body breathe and be together in the spirit of hope. May it feel held by comfort. Those who seek consolation, may they find it in the solace of this moment. This church is a body. It is as strong as all the people who have ever gathered within its walls. It is the power of all they dreamed and all that they have done. This church is a body. It is as vulnerable as the most newborn and untried of its members. 
it is ancient and it is ever new. This church is a story. It is a story of lives that are interwoven, brought together in this place and this time for the simple purpose of caring for one another and helping one another along the arduous path from birth to death. This church is a vision. It is a vision of unity amid diversity. It is a vision of reverence for all of creation. It is a vision that beckons us beyond the concerns of our own skins. May we abide as one body in the spirit of faith, hope and love that is the story and the vision of this church. Amen. Do you wish to do the notices? No, that was it. Do we take the notices? And the we abide as one body in the spirit of faith, hope, and love that is the story and the vision of this church. Amen. Now we're going to mess around with the words for our last hymn today. It's number 130. It's Ours is a Town for Everyone, but we're not going to sing that. We're going to sing Ours is a Church for Everyone. So every time you see the word town, just substitute it with the word church. And following that, we'll have some closing words that were written by Andy Pakula. And then we'll have a go at singing together that little chant that I did at the beginning. As you prepare to leave this sacred space, pack away a piece of this church in your heart. Wrap it carefully like a precious gem. Carry it with you through the joys and sorrows of your days. Let its gentle glow surround you, warm you, remind you of all that is good and true until you gather here again in this place of love. Amen. If I sing a line and then you can sing a line afterwards. Because if you've noticed on here, we've got those of you who read music, there are little repeat marks at the end. So I'll have a go at this. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Where do we come from? What are we? tailor-made which was written in memory of their conductor who gave his life to Bollington it's only a little village but they had a fantastic brass band and uh, Deep Harmony was his favourite piece that I played at the beginning and this was written in his memory and he died after having a stroke but he went along to watch his band perform at a competition and he died as they were actually playing Deep Harmony he just closed his eyes so this piece of music has been written to reflect all that he put into the choir, all those youngsters that he put through their scales and arpeggios and everything else. Thank you very much. Thank you.